Hello, everyone. Um, while our uh, panelists all turn on their screens, um, I think they're all arriving. Um, I want to let you know that this is a conversation on HowlRound about the 2021 Golden Mask Festival in Moscow and specifically the Russian case, which took place uh, April 1st through 6th. Uh, the Russian case is an annual selection of recent productions um, curated specifically for international audiences. And this year, because of the pandemic, it was shown online for the first time. Um, our conversation is sponsored by CITD, which is the Center for International Theater Development in Baltimore, Maryland. And a quick note to those tuning in live, please feel free to share comments with each other uh, via the chat function. Um, but we will not be able to respond as there are many exciting shows to discuss and we wanna keep our conversation under an hour, but we promise we will read your chat um, afterwards. Um, Philip, uh, why don't you kick us off? Welcome everybody. Um, all roads lead to Russia. Yeah. Um, I made my first trip to Eastern Europe in 1975 at the invitation of Grotowski. And between 1975 and 80, I was in Bulgaria, Poland, Romania. And again, I found all these tethers back to Russia. The acting schools in those countries were based on the Russian model. Um, in, two, in 1980, I was supposed to go to Moscow for the Olympic festival. And then we boycotted the Olympics. And I finally made my first trip to Moscow in 1981. Uh, and in those days, the theater was not accessible at all. Uh, you either, you know, had to be getting your degree in Slavic studies somewhere, or you were in tightly controlled official delegations. Um, I went over with uh, ITI on a number of times. I had a couple of State Department sponsored trips. Uh, but in those, in that period, I met a really bright young producer, Edward Boyakov who began talking about op a way of opening this wonderful theater world to the others, to us. And in 2000, he made the first Russia case. And I think there were 30 of us that went. Uh, and I'd been to, it's, this is the 25th um, edition because they couldn't have one last year. I'm very proud of my little uh, golden mask plaque that I got for just showing up. Um, and I would go there and I, over the years, we took about 70 people, 70 Americans. Howard, you went a couple of times. I met Yuri there uh, when he was 25 years old, I think. 20 years ago, he worked uh, with us as a translator and has been with us ever since. And I was always surprised at the work that I found. I found the young Dima Krimov there 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so many artists, Russian artists, but what fed me the most was sitting at a coffee table or in a tea shop or in a restaurant with fellow Americans much smarter than I was talking about this work. And that really informed so much of my understanding of this great theater culture. So I really wanted to see in this special year where there were 40, over 40, I think 43 Americans signed up for the virtual festival instead of 80. 80 was, I think, 80 or 90 were the top 
guests of any festival I ever went to. They had over 400 people watching this one. And so I asked Howard if he'd be willing to, he's one of the smartest people I know, if he'd be willing to bring some other very smart people. And initially I just wanted to sit and listen to make this speech and listen, but um, I'm down to talk about a couple of shows, but I welcome you all to this really unique opportunity at a very unique time in our history and in the history of Russia and in the history of our two theater cultures that I believe have the potential of being more connected now than ever. So thanks. Yeah, thanks coming. Philip. Um, and uh, you didn't, you didn't, you failed to mention that you're the director and founder of CITD. And um, my name is Howard Schalowitz. Um, I am an associate director of CITD along with Yuri. And um, uh, many of you know me as the artistic director emeritus of the Woolly Mammoth Theater Company in Washington, DC. Um, before we dive in, I wanna thank VJ Matthew and HowlRound as well as uh, CITD's ACE project manager, Brandis Thompson, who is behind the scenes with us um, today and providing photos. Above all, uh, thanks to our panelists who include three of my favorite directors in the United States for jumping in on short notice. And I mean short notice, we, we crammed a bunch of shows and, and now we're talking about it. So let's go around and introduce ourselves. And just as a teaser, if you would, just each share one very brief observation about the shows you witnessed um, in this year's uh, Golden Mask. Blanca? So I'm Blanca Ziska, I'm co-founding director of the Wilma Theatre and uh, now co-artistic director of the Wilma. And uh, I think for me, the most interesting thing about the festival, about the sh few shows that I saw, was this integration of political and historical situation and how it is in constant dialogue with today through amazing directorial vision and amazing visual world that is being created and this fantastic acting that you see. I agree, Michael. Hey, uh, Michael Garces, uh, Artistic Director of Cornerstone Theater Company. I'm coming at you from the unceded and occupied land of the Tongva, Quiche, and Gabriela peoples, also known as Los Angeles. Uh, I think I was, uh, one thing I was very struck by uh, was just the wide range of aesthetic strategies uh, uh, and approaches to uh, grappling with text and grappling with performance and, and, and creating pictures of momentum on stage. Uh, and yet, in the context of that variety, there was always a really strong, very singular division, uh, vision uh, for what we were seeing, whether that was uh, auteur, often director's vision, or whether it was a collaborative ensemble's vision, it was extremely specific. Uh, and I, uh, the variety uh, was such that it seemed almost like an international festival, like something like the Ibero-Americano in Bogota or something like that. And I suppose that's because Russia is infinite. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it, was, it was striking that in, 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 the, in, the, in the festival that was celebrating One Nation's Theater, it was so varied and uh, uh, very exciting for that. Thanks, Yuri. Hi, I'm Yuri Urnov. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the co artistic director of the Wilma Theater and also the associate director of CATD. And uh, probably what strikes me and what keeps striking me is this weird paradoxical correlation between Russian politics and Russian art. It almost feels like the worst is the first, the better is the second. Uh, I mean, politically, we really are probably in the deepest hole we've been since 1970s, but theater is blooming, right? I mean, professional quality, I mean, aesthetical variety. I mean, the level of audience's interest and even political outspokenness. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about Boris today, but, you know, being an exquisite work of theater art, it's also quite an open and clear satire, you know, on Putin happening right in front of our horizon, performed by Timofey Tribunsov, who actually got the golden mask for the best male part for that, and I think for a reason. Um, great. Um, Philip, a big, uh, a little observation? I can't. I, it's very difficult for an American to appreciate how important theater is in Russia. That the Golden Mass Festival in the regular time, would the, the awards would be 
would be broadcast all over the country from the Bolshoi Ballet. Uh, these are uh, Oscar level events. And I put that together with my years of seeing theater in that country. And I've seen the fewest empty seats in Russia than of any other theater culture I've seen in the world. This is the life, it's a lifeblood. And it certainly was telling stories before 1989 that I think, <coughs> excuse me, that had a lot to do with 1989. And I think what we saw this past week is pregnant with change. Yeah. And I would, I, I have a, a, a tangential point to add. I just want to add that uh, the quality of the video work that we saw and the subtitling in particular, the English subtitling was absolutely superb. And I think it, it made this year's Russian case in some, and I've been there a couple times in person, but it made this year's in some ways more accessible to more people um, than ever before. So there was something, even though we were in a pandemic, there was something, a historic opportunity um, that this year's presented. And when I see the quality of those videos, I drool just a little bit because I want more, I want more American content um, out there. Um, all right, well, let's, um, um, with those observations on the table, let's dig into uh, some of the shows that most, that at least most of us were able to watch. And as we introduce each one, Brandis um, in the background is going to share a few production photos, um, courtesy of our friends at the Russian case. And Yuri, um, you know, none of us are experts in Russian theater, except you, Yuri. You, you might qualify. You're the closest we have in this group to a bona fide expert on Russian theater. So why don't you get us started with one of your, uh, with one of one of the shows that you watched? Thank you, Howard, for no pressure. Start. That's <laughs> great. Uh, so I'm. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about the tale of the last angel. Uh, actually, yesterday there was a ceremony and the tale once won the main prize, won the uh, best production on big stage. There is a division there, best production on big stage, best production or best production on small stage. So this is directed by Maguchi, one of our lead directors and probably is an amazing example of what we mean when we say director's theater in Russia, which certainly means far beyond just directing a play, far, de far beyond just staging it. While the play is there, and uh, I think it's directed very well, it's staged very well. Uh, in the center there is a quite a realistic plot. A young guy is being thrown out of his apartment by gangsters, hello 90s. He is on the run, he finds a shelter in the insane asylum, another you know quite transparent metaphor for what the place was at that moment. He meets friends there and uh, they decide to escape now the asylum because they want to find the main character's classmate, his love, and they go on a journey. And so at least half of the production is the journey. Uh, they are on the run, they start from a small place, they, and they arrive to a bigger place, Minsk now, the capital of Belarus, Belarus and then they are on the trip to Moscow. Uh, it ends ambivalently. You can say it's success, they find the classmate, he meets his love, or maybe they die, or maybe actually both Both is true, right? Maybe both actually happens. That's the plot. Now, but that's only the start. What Maguchi is, I think, is trying to do is he is trying to explore the phenomenon of the 90s, this pivot point, really, in the Russian history. So he takes us on this journey with all the tools, directorial tools he has in possession and everything is, all tools are equal. It's verbal text, it's visual imagery, it's genre. Uh, I don't know what is, what is, what is stronger, you know, the vision, the vision of the boy who is emerging physically from the huge chicken egg born as in, born into this new reality or the 20 minute monologue of one of the characters that goes into the intermission. Uh, when we say 90s, I mean, not all of us lived through that, so just a brief reminder, right? It's the fall of the empire, it's two coups, 
in Moscow tanks on Moscow streets, wild capitalism, uh, state property for grabs because of that mafia, crime, violence, uh, abundance for the new rich and millions of the new poor. And at the same time, almost unlimited freedom of mass media, of speech, of political choice, open borders, new technologies, no art censorship, sort of time of big hopes, high stakes, and extremely low price of life at the same time. So what we're watching, we're watching again this these boys on the run through this reality of the 90s. But this wouldn't be enough for the director of Maguchi's level. So he adds another layer. He uh, immerses the reality of the 90s into the mythological context of Russian folk, Russian fairy tales. Uh, for example, the main character actually and his double, they both look at the same time as the youth of the 90s as the young person from the 90s but also as this mythological character of even the fool probably one of the um, most prominent characters of the russian fairy tales he is in love with the swan princess who represents his uh, uh, his classmate and his love she is wearing a traditional costume and she is riding on the segway at the same time and at some point in the production these lines these levels mix they merge the mythological meets the real and this is when it's already hard to say are we actually seeing three boys on the run are we seeing three angels of love hope and faith trying to make it through the dark woods of their newborn motherland and this is i think where the production reaches its uh, emotional climax yeah i think this idea of multiple layers is a is a persistent feature michael you saw it as well um what did you? What was your? What was your take on it? Yeah, I mean, I thought the piece was uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, delightful. <laughs> it was a lot of fun to watch. It, um, I mean, in, in some ways, it was a classic road trip play, which was actually, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there was a real, it was a strong plot through line that took you through this crazy adventure uh, with a lot of layers on top of that, which is fun to try to decipher, both in the context of my limited knowledge, not being an expert <laughs> uh, on Russian uh, history or uh, uh, contemporary Russian life, uh, but at the same time uh, mirroring, you know, you know, a lot of things happening in, in different parts of the world. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, a, a way of thinking about it, really sort of even understanding it stylistically for me is thinking about it as sort of a cross between like a Hunter Thompson leaving Las Vegas type thing with with various different levels of reality happening at the same time. And, you know, thinking of it as a sort of straight uh, Fantasia on uh, on Russian themes, uh, you know, what I mean, like as, as Kushner sort of sort of took on the 80s uh, as a moment of rampant capitalism and sort of uh, a, 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 a culture in deep uh, crisis. Uh, I think this, this play does the same thing with the 90s in, 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 in ways that were uh, profound and moving. Wow. Um, yeah, that was certainly one of the big shows. It, it, it's what, three and a half hours long, or something like that, but it, it's, it's just uh, stunning to watch. Uh, Michael, why don't you keep, uh, Philip, you wanna add something? Uh, you're, you're muted, Phil. Phil, you're muted. There you go. Uh, I followed Maguchi for about as long as I followed uh, Dima Krimov. I saw his early work. He had a small company in St. Petersburg called the Formalny Theater. And right now he's at the top of his game and he can write his own ticket. Uh, and we've some come so close to getting this man looked at in America and he's, we never made the right connection. And I thought that piece that I saw uh, in the festival was the most muscular piece I'd ever seen him do. And I've probably seen a dozen of his pieces over the years. It was really a triumph. Well, well maybe we can, we can uh, pray for the opportunity to, to get his work to the United States. Um, Michael, um, take take uh, take us on a, another little journey here. Um. Yeah, uh, sure. This one is uh, 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 the man with no name. Um, I will leave uh, pronunciations to my fellow um, uh, panelists. 
Uh, but this is a piece uh, uh, that uh, was made uh, in a collaborative way, uh, the, the, at least notionally, uh, it's, it's what's being termed horizontal theater. So it's a group of people, not necessarily devising it, although I think partially, but certainly a group of people, uh, not, not necessarily uh, in service to an auteur's vision, uh, but working together, in this case, the performer, the composer, uh, who also performed as well as the set designer and a director and the AD of the Gogol Center, uh, Kirill uh, Serebrennikov, all worked together with a dramaturg and writer uh, to create this piece. And it's based on the life and work of a fairly obscure, I think even to a Russian audience from the uh, <laughs> Russians I've talked to, uh, 19th century writer who's also a mystic and an inventor of uh, musical instruments. Um, kind of feels like a, like he was a character in a Dostoevsky novel in a way. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I, I, think, I think part of the point of this play, which is absolutely not a bio play, is the obscurity of the source, which uh, creates a kind of freedom for the, to, for the creators. Uh, and uh, they base it on, on roughly his life, I think, but also on sort of esoteric uh, 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 chemical texts that, uh, that are purported at least to be the basis of the structure of the piece. Uh, and I think it's more of a pretext for their own exploration of themes and of, of craft, really. Um, and I think of the work more as a composition than a play, per se. Um, and what was really lovely and uh, actually rather glorious uh, about the piece for me was it as a purely aesthetic experience. It's, uh, it was poetic in the best sense of the word. It was carefully structured and rigorous, quite lean, I would say, but extremely intuitive uh, and, and, and sourced in the subconscious. Uh, so giving over, giving over to it was kind of like having a waking dream, which, was, uh, which is a, a state I like in the theater. Uh, and uh, I, I think it is not possible to divorce it from its context. So it was hard not to sort of sift through it and see dynamics in it that are situated in, in the sort of socio-political context of contemporary Russia. Uh, and uh, particularly the situation of Gogol Center, which I'll let uh, Blanca or Howard or Yuri expand on as they, I think, are more knowledgeable than I. But there is, there is a certain political pressure, uh, uh, a, re a very real uh, and menacing political pressure that's being exerted on artists now. And I, I, it's hard not to see it in that context. But the piece itself, I think, feels uh, rather abstracted. Uh, it's essentially a duet between this, uh, the remarkable performer, uh, uh, Nikita Kukushkin, I did my best there, uh, who uh, gives a, a, a really precise, incredibly physical performance, uh, and the composer who plays uh, what is ultimately the set, uh, which is uh, a 10 pianos that have been uh, uh, turned into one giant machine of an instrument, uh, and it sort of gets revealed over time through uh, lighting and staging, which is quite beautiful, and it's, uh, 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 it's, it's sort of an elaborate and complex uh, version of a prepared John Cage piano, essentially. Uh, and yeah. both performers interact with pianos in really surprising uh, and, and uh, uh, striking ways. Uh, and, this, and the sounds that have been, uh, come from it are quite glorious. Um, and you know, I, I think the progression of play from moment to moment, from scenario to scenario, scenario is a sort of a way of, uh, again, uh, exploring theme, exploring the sort of emotional journey that the audience is on with the uh, performer, uh, but it's sort of like watching, I don't know, a theatrical equivalent of Bach's Art of Fugue or, or Ned Coleman's Skies of America. Like there are sort of, uh, it's rooted in experience and, and, and you feel this sort of story, uh, but it's not necessarily overt. Uh, and it was quite exciting. Um, Yuri, can you just uh, fill in the, the context with Sarah Brenyakov that Michael was referencing? I mean, just the, the basics are, are that he just came off, is it two years of house arrest? on basically what, what we consider trumped up charges of embezzlement and uh, is, how do you read that? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a saga in the Russian theater and probably the big turning point for the Russian theater when Kirill Seremnikov was brought to the old and kind of dying theater of Gogol and transformed it into the Gogol Center, really created a new place out of that, both physically bringing new audiences, bringing new aesthetics, bringing new actors, his students. and. At some point, because he was quite radical, probably in his aesthetics, more in his politics, uh, they came after him, right? So they, they, were, they tried to, I mean, the authorities, I mean, they, there was an attempt to destroy the center. There was, attempt, there was a big case in the court that kept going. He was under home arrest, but his managing director was actually in prison and mm. another product producing director, you know, was in prison for even longer than that. Uh, there was a huge uh, pushback from the, at least at least in Moscow, from the theater society, but probably around the country. So it didn't end as bad as it could, but it was certainly a great challenge. 
And yeah, and clearly one way to view the piece is through the lens of that experience that, that he and the whole company, the Gogol Center, have been through. But as you said, Michael, you can just set that all aside and just take it in on the purely aesthetic level and the incredible acrobatics and the flying pianos and, you know, all of the pyrotechnics of the piece. Blanca? Yeah, I do want to say that for me, coming like from that world, it was very much about that experience of alienation and seclusion, you know, because when you are on your own, when you are, when you are stuck without being in contact with the world around you, you start to like talk about, think about obscurity and you find this writer, right? And I love the way it started, the piece started, that this actor comes among the audience and it's a discussion, do you know this writer, do you know this book, right? And there are maybe two or three people in the audience who do. And then it's that question about like, what is memory? How long do we last actually? Our lives or lives to remember how even memory lasts, you know, how long does it last? And that sense of when Beethoven comes in as, as a, you know, the character that is lo losing his, his, uh, his hearing as he's at the, you know, his highest power of composing. And again, that sense of isolation and incapability of, of actually practice your art. I think it was very much imbued by that experience of home arrest. Yeah, the way that politics are sort of embedded in the aesthetics is, is yeah. certainly yeah. astonishing. Blanca, why don't you uh, push us forward with uh, 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 an, another show that had a very strong political ramifications. Yeah, uh, so, you know, I really love Dima Grimov's work. Um, you know, we'll be working with him at the Wilma on a check of peace, but so I know him a little bit from, from also the workshop situations at the Wilma. And, you know, Dima says that he's very interested when he looks at the wood, he's interested only in the knots, knots in the wood, you know, represent a crisis. And he's not interested in the space between the knots. He is interested only in the knots. So, so his theater becomes very episodic because he goes from a picture or from crisis to crisis to crisis, right? And in some ways, Boris Godunov for me was really difficult because of this episodic quality um, to, and because it was really theater for Russians. You know, you recall the satire and you need to live in the country in order to understand the humor and the satire. So for me, it was a little, little bit tough, but as I understand it, it's a satire on Putin and a little bit also on the relationship between Putin and Alexa, Alexei Navalny, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the um, uh, opposite opposition leader who was, who was poisoned by, by Putin. Um, the play itself has several roots, you know, there is a historical, um, Boris Godunov, who lived around the same time as Shakespeare uh, in the time of trouble, Russian history is called time of trouble. And then there is a Pushkin play from 1830 that is dealing with the historical time, you know, and the, the character of Boris Godunov is this conspirer who is uh, killing the son of the Tsar in order to, 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 to retain power and plots around, you know, of, uh, has actually the assassinated, ass ass assassinators then being found out and assassinated or, 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 or judged and, and, and I don't know, it's very complicated history. Yeah. Yuri, you must, you must jump in anytime you, please, please. And, um, and then it's dealing with today's and with Putin, right? So we have all these three levels and, um, and um, um, I found it very confusing because I didn't understand it. And I, so I asked Yuri to explain it to me. So Yuri, maybe you should do that again. <laughs> well, again, I, I, I do think that I, I do think that there is the, the, there are parts of that that are very straightforward and actually more straightforward than Dima usually goes and probably more straightforward than many other theaters go with, with the figure of the leader, with the figure of Putin in this case. I do think that the opening sequence, it's this, it's, you know, it's this inauguration. It's Putin getting into power. I think that's what, that's specifically the moment he is looking at. He is not, he is looking at the early Putin. He is looking at the person who is, suddenly finds himself 
with all this power in his hands and suddenly starts thinking himself as of a supernatural human being right and this and, and, and i and this is what i think tribunsov is doing so brilliantly so for me this first this first part was probably or the production honestly the whole production was probably the most exciting piece in the festival because it combined this to it combined this amazing cream of aesthetics of bright clear standing images like the one when the coffins are brought out on stage and we see the former rulers rulers of russia whom putin is asking the advice to praying to crazily and trying to put himself in the row with them but at the same time putin is putting him in the row with them not in the coffin exactly but sort of on the way to so i i do think there is there is a lot of real meat there for 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 emotional meat political meat for the Russian yeah, spectator. and I, I would I would just add that um, the, you know D, Dima Krimov began as a designer and then has evolved into being a major director, and I've seen several of his pieces before. The level of the acting in this piece, the various confrontations between these everyday characters and the Putin figure, you know, some of them just take your breath away because they are so emotionalized. And I felt for for Krimov, mm -hmm. it was a a higher level than we've maybe than I've ever seen before, of of uh, emphasis on the power of the uh, of the actors, um, in those confrontations. You know, uh, Philip, go ahead. Yeah, and and also it wasn't, it was in a very unique space. Yeah. Um, it, this was not again. We weren't looking at a proscenium arch, but uh, I don't know where was that done at the. It was the, the uh, Moscow the uh, Museum right? of at the museum, uh, yeah. yeah, a museum ah, of okay. modern art on the on the upper floor. So it had this wonderful okay. environmental feeling as well. Yeah, good point. Um, you know what? We should take a moment uh, while we're talking about Kremov to talk about the other sh other Dmitry Kremov show in the Russian case, and uh, it was a very in a very different vein than Boris. Um, the title uh, is "We Are All Here." Um, and this piece is a real treat for any American theater maker, uh, especially for those of us in Washington, DC. It's built around Kremov's own memories as a teenager of seeing the arena stage production of Thornton Wilder's Our Town directed by Alan Schneider uh, when it toured to Moscow in 1973. Um, and Kremov recreates some key scenes from the production. There's a Kremov stand-in character who steps in and interacts with the actors and shares his memories of bringing his famous theater parents to see our town because he was so taken with it. Um, he also slips in, in the, in the previous slide you saw, this hilarious fantasy encounter between Anton Chekhov and a famous con artist um, that helps explain why Chekhov made the transition from being a, a short story writer to being a playwright. And it, it's all sort of hilarious. But then he manages in this slide you're seeing now to sort of tear our hearts out with the final cemetery scene from our town. And I've never seen the scene done better. And uh, we, need to, we need to push on. But I just wonder really quickly if the rest of you found this production as absolutely captivating as I did. I thought it was delightful. Yeah. It was also really, really, really funny and surreal, you know, uh, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and it had that typical, uh, D Dima Kremov talks about his work as like laying a trail of breadcrumbs for the audience. <laughs> so it's not conventional narrative cause and effect dramaturgy. It's like one thing creates an expectation for the next thing, creates an expectation for the next thing. And I thought he did that really, really well here. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so just uh, I'm just uh, t talking to all of us to, to, to move a little more quickly. Philip, um, give us uh, an introduction to... Uh, gonna, of Gorbachev. Yeah. Uh, Alvis Hermanis, who's a Latvian director, took this very... Uh, stay on that slide, uh, if you will, uh, because the photographs don't do this service because what he took was this biography of uh, Gorbachev and his wife, but there they are in character with wigs playing at a certain moment. But behind them, you can see two actor dressing tables. So the, the play is a laminate of two actors coming in to run lines together, right? 
taking yeah. off their speedo, their fancy sneakers, uh, talking to each other with side comments, then coming script in hand and playing the scene. And then all of a sudden putting on a wig or a piece of costume and then immersing themselves in the reality of that moment in time. If you'll flip to the next slide. Uh, and this, these are two really fine uh, and well-known actors and they just are pitch perfect in playing each of those levels of laminate. Uh, that's the young, that's the first date. And there you really can't see, but it's right towards the end where uh, I remember Robin Williams says, how could you run a country with a map of something, something on your forehead, Estonia on your forehead, I think what he said. Uh, but I just found it a delight. It, it personalized, and it's a huge hit in Moscow, uh, but it really, uh, you know, his final speech is about how freedom is more important than he is. Uh, and he, they're almost like looking at heroic statues of these two people. Um, and I was just stunned by how precise and uh, th 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 there was no question that where was the meat? on this one it was there every moment of a yeah i mean a base at, at its core it's just this beautiful love story yeah um and 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 uh, almost appears to be non-political but uh, yuri i think you said in our discussion if you're doing a play about gorbachev it's it's immediately political because of the, the mixed name. feelings that russians have about him uh, but it, it it certainly doesn't put the political uh forward yeah, and also just the I, I think there is a level of statement there too. It's you're watching that and you're subconsciously consciously juxtaposing to what is happening there today, and that feels. I think this is the work that is really happening during the production, in the head and the mind of the audience. This is what this is what we had. This is what we lost. This is what we have now. I think that's the tension, and also yeah. certainly the presence of Gorbachev himself in the audience is, in, was a in strong the performance gesture. Performance on video, yeah. Gorbachev yeah. is there at the very end and, and congratulates the cast. So, um, uh, talk about layers of the experience. Um, Michael Blanca, any any uh, little thoughts to add? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be a slightly dissenting voice, uh, just and again from a perspective of somebody who's not a, a Russian theater goer and habitually, um, there was something about the nostalgia in the piece uh, that felt a little um, uh, that felt a little dangerous. It was there was a sentimentality to it, like it was so absent of context. It was so, like you didn't even know that they had children. <laughs> much less that he had a political career basically, other than sort of, you know, he had to go to work and he was away from her, which was a drag because they were so in love. Until the very end of the play when the kids were around the deathbed. And he just so, sort of seemed like a nice guy who somehow became yeah. the chair of the Soviet Communist Party. And that, I mean, it felt like Nancy and Ronnie in same time next year in a way. And it was beautifully <laughs> crafted and sophisticated in, in how it was put together. It was a very sophisticated production, same time next year, as opposed to a typical, I don't know, regional theater production of it. But nonetheless, I, I, I was troubled by the sort of, uh, now again, I'm seeing it absent context that in context might give it a whole different uh, shades of meaning and contrasting Gorbachev with Putin and et cetera, et cetera. But just seeing it for me, I, it was a little, it was the, the, the nostalgia and the sentimentality of it were a little troubling, although I could admire the craft, absolutely. No, but it's doing something very, very sly. You're, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting in the, in the after party of the Golden Mask, which I attended, you know, it very much divided Russian opinion. Uh, sort of 50-50, so, you know, people who loved it and people who, who kind of f found it, um, you know, not, not that, that significant. So it's great to hear that, that voice. Well, listen, I'm going to push ahead and I'm going to um, actually cheat slightly in this round and because I want to briefly lift up two shows that featured women directors and all women ensembles. And this is something that I have to say has been quite rare uh, in the Russian case and perhaps in Russian theater in general over the years. 
Um, the first is uh, Frost the Red Nose, um, which is an experimental chamber opera based on a famous uh, 19th century narrative poem by Nekrasov. And it, it tells the story of a young peasant woman who essentially works herself to death to provide for her children after her husband dies, if I'm reading it right. There, again, there's a lot of layers even to the original narrative poem. But I think it is seen as a kind of proto-feminist work extolling the devotion and self-sacrifice of Russian women. The music in this chamber opera is eerie and dreamlike and it features these choral episodes sung by young women and girls and an astonishing long solo opera that's made up entirely of breathing and glottal sounds. So sometimes it gets quite experimental. But the striking thing is that the director, Maria Brusnikina, if I've got it right, uses the, the small practica theater space very creatively. She <coughs> begins here um, in this photo in the tiny lobby where the audience stands among these, these narrow tree trunks. And then she moves um, into the uh, theater um, uh, where the audience sits for the bulk of the piece and the central figure is here um, in the foreground and the chorus of, of young women and girls. And then surprisingly, it moves into a second small theater at Practica where the audience stands and witnesses the funeral of the peasant woman and watches her essentially slip into her grave. And this uh, actress who you're seeing here and uh, a well-known vocalist, Olga Vlasova, she gives a mesmerizing performance from start to finish. And I have to say this piece really grew on me. I, uh, I especially appreciated this collision of highbrow musical experimentation against the old text from the Russian folk tradition, which mirrors in some way what you were talking about, Yuri, with the tale of the last angel, this collision of old, old and new. Um, and then one more um, uh, all, all women ensemble, this, a play called Finnist the Brave Falcon um, comes from an independent theater project called the SOSO Daughters. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to pronounce that so so uh, daughters, <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, but in many ways, I think it presents an almost opposite view of Russian women. Um, the play is based on interviews and interrogation transcripts related to young R Russian women who are recruited online by ISIS. And we follow the experience of the, a few different women who attempt to escape to Syria. Uh, one of them are, they try to marry ISIS fighters. They, and they get stuck in various nightmare scenarios that are obviously the opposite of the paradise that they were uh, promised online. Um, but I felt the piece was also a commentary on how Russian women feel they're treated by Russian men. Um, it begins with this very lively monologue by a woman complaining about all the ways she's been ignored and abused and unsupported by various boyfriends. I felt women all over the world would love to see this monologue, um, but it forces us to ask throughout the rest of the piece, what, what is it that these women need so desperately from men that they could imagine that they would find it you know, in a deadly uh, war zone. My, Michael, I'm curious how, how you responded. You're the other one who saw it. Yeah, I mean, I thought the piece was dope. Uh, I thought it was uh, uncompromising uh, in a way that I really admire um, and unapologetically political, unapologetically feminist. Uh, I thought uh, some of the theatrical thing, uh, tactics they use, like turning the trial transcripts, because at least some of the women are tried on return to Russia, yep. uh, which, you know, really, uh, it's just firing, uh, a frying pan into the fire. Um, our song is can cantatas quite beautifully and uh, are really striking in the, the uh, contrast between the, the, the bleak situation these people are in and the, uh, and the, um, and the, the beauty, the rigorous beauty of the, of the singing. Portrait. I will also say that the women are not oh. portrayed as victims, nor are they uh, essentialized. I mean, they're really is complex. Is, and is Michael, you cannot hear me? You're in and out a little bit, your connection. Um, I see, keep going. sorry. Keep going, we got you now. Uh, I'll just say that the, 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 the characters, the women who take this journey are, are presented in a great deal of complexity and not sort of uh, portrayed as victims or, or sort of given really simple motivations, which I, I really appreciated. Yeah, and they combine roles of victims of the, the women and the interrogators, you know, they, they take a variety of roles. And so you see them in many, many different guises and power, power dynamics, which is very, very exciting. Um, well, listen, it looks like we have time to sneak in sort of a quick lightning round. I don't know if we'll get through all of it, but I'd like to just hear about a few more shows that only one or two of us watch just to expand the palette here a little bit. Um, Blanca, um, coming back to you, is there another production that you found just especially intriguing? 
I really did love Investigation of Horror, which is a production that was uh, that was staged directly in a communal apartment in one of the places from 20s and 30s where people, you know, more, more than one family had to live, share apartment. And it was about a group called Oberiu in, uh, in, in, in Petersburg of avant-garde artists, writers especially, and theater people. And they were just meeting to kind of talk to each other about what interests them in life, what they are, what they are inspired by, and they talked from everything, like daily little practical things to philosophy of living and nature and um, position of soul or not, and um, uh, they were all leftists. Um, but what you are facing in that evening, and or. Um, it's all happening in the apartment, basically audience, there's probably less people in the audience than the actors in the group. And they all are having dinner, very poor dinner with you know, potatoes and tea. And as the evening goes on, you are seeing just sl slightly and slowly how the environment in which they are living and the fear that the environment is creating is seeping in. So the friendship is falling apart. And by the end of the evening, you are feeling this desolate, desolate uh, emptiness almost. People are parting, parting almost as enemies by the end of it. And you know from the historical situation that a few years later, um, all these artists were executed. Mm -hmm. um, what I loved about it is that this piece was created by artists, young artists from Russia today, and they have inhabited and embodied these characters so persuasively. It was painful to watch, you know, how beautifully imminent it was and you felt like you are totally in the middle of it. It was also beautifully filmed. I think they had at least three or four cameras and the cameras were like finding little details that were revealing these situations and the ideas and the characters in a beautiful way. The other thing that was really interesting because the group, the original group was very male. This production was cast mostly by women. There were some men, but it was mostly, and there was something about it that it created kind of empathetic sense to it, you know, kind of embrace. Um, the director basically says that the, the play is about ideas and thoughts, and those are sexless and ageless. So anybody can portray these characters. Yeah, it's an example of immers immersive theater at its best. Michael, you want to um, lift a show up? Uh, sure. Uh, I could talk about Spin, uh, uh, directed by Yuri uh, Katkovsky. Uh, uh, R. Yuri could be, feel free to correct me. Um, and uh, R. Yuri is probably better to talk about this, but this was a play that, was, that I saw that was most overtly political and mostly overt overtly political in terms of being about the present. Uh, I found it very exciting. Uh, the piece is uh, ostensibly uh, about, uh, it's staged in a very small theater. It's a very elaborate production, a very small theater uh, about a Russian, uh, I think the term is often used as oligarch, uh, who is, uh, 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 who, who's, lose, who's, who's losing his foundation, his wealth and his, his power as I think the state starts to move in on it. Uh, and he's portrayed deeply unsympathetically, uh, but you start to build sympathy as you understand that you as an audience are actually part of the system that is surveilling him. Uh, so we're seeing we're seeing intimate intimate scenes of of a morning uh, in which in which there's this real sense of danger. It actually reminds me a little bit uh, blank of what you were talking about the other piece. You feel the danger encroaching even as they're in this very ostentatious situation and wakes up in the morning and he has sex with his wife and then they get ready and then there's this long breakfast in which people treat each other both poorly but also lovingly and it's very complicated, beautifully beautifully uh, enacted scene and you feel the the encroaching sort of horror of the danger of what's gonna to happen to him and to them. Uh, and, and again, they're not idealized in any way. It's actually a deeply unsympathetic portrait, but, you, but also a very complex and human one. So you start to, start to empathize. And, um, and then the play sort of suddenly shifts into a, a very operatic mode that didn't quite work as well for me, but, uh, but I appreciated that it didn't sort of just become sort of interrogation porn or something like that, but really sort of then uh, sort of broke, broke up in a very theatrical way uh, what was happening to him after the state sort of intervened in his life. Uh, it was quite a remarkable piece, I thought. 
Yeah, um, I think there's been so many interesting examples of sort of dystopian um, drama um, in in the last several years in Europe, and uh, that's I just, great. That's great. I just have to add that the play itself is written by Vladimir Sorokin, which is probably the most important contemporary Russian writer and also playwright, and also a very controversial figure politically. Yeah, really you know, um, Philip, we're running. Give us a quick thumbnail of uh, the observers, if you would, Philip. Uh, yeah, object theater. Uh, knowing that those two puppeteers weren't alive when the uh, when the gulags were going on, these are actual um, uh, artifacts from the gulags. Wow, we're led to believe, uh, and they are animated. Uh, at least the cups, some of the cups are not because they're in every performance beaten up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some wonderful music to it, but it's a real meditative look at dark times. But I want to make a coda here in looking at what we've looked at, the incredible diversity. There's a number that I always would start off taking an American to Russia about the number of working theaters in Moscow. Yuri, is it like 1,200? Is that? Mm. I, 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 don't, I won't give you the number, but we're talking hundreds. I think there was over 500 at some point, six, close to 600. And, just, and that's, the, that's the ground that this grows out of. Mm. This fertile ground of people that are not slung across 3,000 miles, but are there in this really dense and, uh, and fertile community. And boy, the proof in the pudding is what we've been talking about for the last 50 minutes. You know, I, uh, there's so many more shows that we could profile. I, I loved The Sun. Uh, the Florian Zeller play from uh, the Parisian Paris playwright that was given a Russian spin that just like turned it into this kind of gargantuan, uh, abstra more abstract Greek tragedy. Uh, Yuri, I think you were a big fan of the tale of Igor's campaign, um, but um, the list goes on. But let's let's jump ahead. I I um, I wish we could talk about all of them, but can we come back to just for our last few minutes? Some of those big themes and trends that you talked about at the beginning, um, you know, things that we um, that you know that we that we could learn from or even think about as as American artists. Um, Yuri, why don't you start us off again and sort of come back to some of those, the point you made about politics in in light of what we've just talked about. Well, again, I'm I, I, it's almost a repetition, but I but I do think we will mention this notice of you know aesthetics as politics, and how. And, and how, and how at the moment when there is there is there is a moment of you know there is a feeling that after years of murkiness you know the, this regime was playing you know multiple hands we are we are powerful but there is a liberal wing this is this and that happening it feels like we're living through the moment of crystallization when the regime is making a choice right when we're going to the clear totalitarians secret service ruled state this is happening now right mm -hmm. you, you know the, the the yesterday thank lord the military you know forces backed up from the ukrainian border we don't know will it you know will they come back in a week or not right so the, but there is there is some le some feeling of crystallization crystal like evil evil pronounces itself as evil <laughs> and this moment of crystallization i think is demandful for the artist as well it feels like a lot of a lot of murkiness is gone. Like there is a moment of masks off. We need to choose the side, uh, not only politically but somewhat aesthetically too. Because again, let's remember in Russia that's the same thing, right? <laughs> Aesthetics is politics, and and this is where I find the works we're seeing this year so articulated, much more clear, much more. The 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 messages are clearer. The the form is clearer. The pronunciation is clearer as well. So that's. Yeah, even even though to us as Americans it looks like you know these are all very multi-layered works, the the messages come through um, with 
with a, a, a lot of power in in an awful lot of these shows. And that's a change. That's 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 like we like the, it was going sort of everywhere. It, it, people were much less much less precise for, for for a number of years. There is some feeling of now we're getting to some level of clarity. Um, other other big uh, big observations. Anyone? I just want to follow up on what, what Yuri was saying, because I feel, yes, there is much more clarity and political strength in maybe from what you have seen before, but I still feel that inside of this uh, kind of political force, there is a lot of space for me as an observer, as an audience member, because it's po there is still ambiguity, ambiguity about human existence. Yeah, and we are always looking at individual and times and history, how, how they are in interaction with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and there are, you know, there are questions that are being probed and thrown at me. And that's why I find it so exciting because actually I'm left with something, those questions that haunt me after a production. Instead of giving a full answers and telling me I should be thinking this or that, or this is right, or this is wrong. I am actually putting myself out there and questioning what I am about, who am I, and how, how I am connecting to these shows. Mm. Um, um, you Michael? know, so there is a there is a dialogue that continues then afterwards for me. Oh, absolutely. Uh, sure. Uh, I would say uh, a, a little bit of response to what Yuri said. Uh, I think uh, aesthetic is political here too. And whether it's a politics in a lot of what I would say is mainstream theater of acquiescence and subordination, or whether it is on the rare occasion of, uh, or hopefully less and less rare occasion of resistance and critique and, 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 and uh, uh, opposition, uh, you know, I think the United States, American theater is very political in often troubling ways. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, American theater tends to, to be very text-based. And I, I just argue again that like the, the idiosyncrasy and the power of the vision of the people, uh, whether it was a director or whether it was a collective making the piece elevated the text and made the text more powerful. It did not diminish the text. And I'd love to see more of that, uh, you know, across the board because it's very powerful when it can happen. And there's tremendous pressure put on American artists not to do that very thing in a lot of our uh, theaters. And I think it's, it, it impoverishes our theater. Yeah, the visuals carry so much meaning in the, in, in the Russian theater, um, if, I, if I'm reading you right. Visuals and also just the power, the, the powerful choices the actors are making. Uh, oh. the, the, you know, the striking staging scenes, whether they're visually powerful or not, they still have a distinct point of view. Yeah. And that is, uh, I, I, I find, I want to see more of. Yeah, no, it's it's intense. That I, I didn't talk about the sun, but the sun was an example of a, a Western play, a, a Parisian playwright, uh, Florian Zeller. But the Russian production does exactly what you're talking about. It like it it just pulls the lid off of it. It, it amplifies the conflict mm -hmm. to a, almost the painful point where you almost can't watch it, but it gives it this. Um, sort of tragic lift and asks you to think maybe deeper questions than you would if you were just seeing a psychologically realistic, you know, a, a sort of typical American style production. So, yeah. um, Philip, do you want to, uh, any last point you want to make? Yeah, I want to say that I think what we've looked at today meets the moment, the moment in Russia and the moment on the planet. Uh, I first heard this past weekend, somebody used the term a species-wide pandemic, not a global pandemic, but a species-wide pandemic. And then I came across a quote from uh, Arundhati Roy, a writer, who said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. Mm -hmm. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. Mm -hmm. And I feel that Russia in the, those six days was giving us a windsock saying, yes, it's blowing this way. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Well, now I want to go, hearing all of you talk, I want to go back and watch all the productions I missed yeah. that, um, yeah. and many others. Um, and I want to watch the ones I've already seen another, another time. But unfortunately, they were only online for six days. There was a little bit of reference at the, at the uh, after party about them maybe making them available again. So stay mm. tuned. Um, I want to thank everyone um, who tuned in for joining us and uh, uh, hope others will watch this afterwards. You can find more details about the Golden Mask Festival with a list of all the productions at goldenmask.ru. And then you got to poke through and find the Russian case. And um, I want to uh, say thank you once again to HowlRound and to all of you all, our panelists, for providing at short notice, uh, very smart, as Philip said, very smart eyes and ears um, on this year's historic uh, Russian Case Festival. Hopefully we'll see one another next spring in Moscow. Thank you all. Thanks.